Hey guys, today the plan, today the plan is ARC 107, starting soon. Uh, I'm just going to begin by updating the sub count, and as you can see, we are very close to MLE, I can feel it, it's only like 9 million more, so that should happen soon. Um, let's get rid of everything, include at coder so I can give myself a compiler later, and we'll be good. Let's begin. Simple math. Given our three positive integers a, b, and c, compute the following value, modulo this, which is this. Okay, so the idea basically is the idea is like if you have something like three, like just like look at this sum. You can think of it like the sum from a equals 1 to, to a of everything else. And therefore, we only need to consider the sum of a. And in the same way, we only have to consider the sum of b and c. Um, times x times x minus 1 over 2 x plus 1, let me just change this to y and z, I think that's right. times v. Let me just do the same thing here because overflow is awesome. And then z, z, and then this is ants times v, and this is ants times v because why not? Overflow, yay. So this is x mod, 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 mod. Okay. Looks good. We call drupals of A, B, C, D satisfy the following condition. A plus B minus C minus D is equal to K. Oh, we got that right. Okay. Okay, so say we fix A and B, I suppose. Um, say we fix A and B. So for example, let's say A equals 5, B equals 7, and we'll say K equals 9 or something. Then we have 12, and we need to subtract two numbers, C and D, that sum to 3, which is simple because... Well, the possible pairs that sum to any number X is... 1 comma x minus 1, 2 comma x minus 2, etc. I can do the downward dots to be cool. x minus 2 comma 2, and x minus 1 comma 1. Okay, now... Like, what does that do? How do we efficiently compute this? Well... Essentially, we start off with this many, which is um, x minus 1 in total. And then for each time that we can't use one of these, we have to subtract two of these. So this is the difference between... Um, 
it's let's see so if we can use this one then x minus 2 is less than or equal to n so we're interested in the k where x minus k is less than or equal to n then we can then we have to subtract 2 times k minus 1 and this is simply um what are we looking for we're looking for x right Now we're looking for k. So x minus n is less than or equal to k. Wait, what? <sighs> Actually, where x minus k is equal to n, I guess. Then k is x minus n. Yeah, okay, sure. So um, this is simple, except we have to fix both a and b. So we can do the exact same thing. Instead of fixing a and b, fix the sum of a and b, and then everything just works out. Um, what is this? So we have four numbers. So four li equals k. Um. Oh wait, we don't. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Um. How do we do this? So it's the number of ways to get a sum of s. So sum minus one, and then we have to figure out what to subtract. So say we want to sum 10 and n is 5. We could do 1. Um, n is, is it times 2 times? So we want to sum 10 and n is 6. That means that we subtract out 3 of them. I'm going to write that first and then think about it because that's the best way to do things. So say this goes up to 10, we want a sum of 10, and we have n equals 6, which means all numbers must be at most 6. Then like these three are gone, and these three are gone. So that works. If n is 10, for example, then this number will just be negative. Wait, this should be sum minus n or n minus sum how does this work yeah it's when the numbers are too big so if n is 11 everything's happy if n is 10 everything's also happy if n is 9 if n is 8 that's where we start having problems if n is 8 then we get 1 and then we um, have to do that um, so let's see n weighs i then I think it should be actually just n ways i times m ways i minus k. It should be k plus 2 because that's the only way we can have c and d that exist. Doesn't print an answer. Nice. Three one four six oh seven four oh oh. Okay, um, that looks good. I mean, it's right. Is that gonna work everywhere? I think so. Some minus one, some minus m minus one, tope minus two times that. Mhm. Mm and then this is just sum the things up. Is it gonna overflow? I mean, if the answer, don't think it would overflow. 
this won't overflow because these are both long long so it's only if the answer would overflow but they don't take us they don't tell us to do mod or anything so I assume it won't next should be o of n cubed anyway the sum so that's fine sure shuffle permutation No oh, fun. <coughs> Do the array elements matter? Why would the array elements matter? It's like equivalent to them all being like just equal to their position, isn't it? Oh, oh, okay, never mind, never mind, never mind. Yeah, we need the actual array elements, sure. Ah, I see, so all rows and all columns must be less than or equal to k. Hmm. I just love math. So like for example, you can't swap these two because these sum up to 16. You can't swap these two because these sum up to 14, but you can swap these two and these two. Interesting. Oh, and he can swap these two as well. So one interesting thing is that if two things can be swapped, then I think like say two rows can't be swapped. Um, for example, like you have this matrix one five one one thousand, right? Then these two rows can't be swapped. Let's say k equals seven. I don't know. Then these two rows can't be swapped because the sum of these is too big. So the only thing you can do to these two rows relative to each other is swapping the columns, but that keeps all of the values on the same columns. So like it doesn't change anything. If two things can't be swapped, they'll never be able to be swapped. Um, what does that mean for us? It means there are a certain number of swaps you can do. And interesting. Is it some component stuff going on? <coughs> I feel like we're supposed to make a graph out of this, just like thinking about this. Because the idea is, say you have something like this, where you have, say you have like a ton of different A's, and all these A's can be different values, but you can't swap any A with another A. But you can swap this, you can swap this X with anything. And the idea is that um, just with this, I think you can sort the array. Or you can put the array in any order you want. Because you can swap this x with any element and then move it out of order, for example, to the end. And then you can kind of like propagate this x back so that the x moves back at the end, but the array elements are still in the changed order. And so you can ch kind of like move any element to the end without changing anything. And that's enough to sort the array. Because you can do it for like the increasing order and stuff. And you can do it for any order, not just sorted. 
So if you have some element that can swap with everything, um, then that's good. But the issue is sometimes there isn't an element that can swap with anything. For example, say we have this graph where this can swap with this, and this can swap with this, and this can swap with this, and this can swap with this, but it's like a tree, and this can't swap with this. Interesting. <laughs> I think it should still be possible. I'm not entirely sure. Don't see why it wouldn't be, is the question. This is annoying. But this is um, 3 factorial times 2 factorial, which is interesting to me. Because I'm sure we can swap any two nodes. No, it's not swapping any two nodes. It's just swapping any two things that are connected with an edge. And somehow we want to show that we can get any sort of, any permutation of the elements by only swapping elements that have an edge between them. Like any permutation of this component is what I think. Because if we can do that, then everything's simple. We can just cheese it with DSU or something simple. Does it matter that these are like this? No, if it does. Oh, it does because it has to be unique, right? Okay, that's fine. Uniqueness is fine. I just want to make sure everything works out. So the rows and columns are independent, meaning we can solve for rows like by their by themselves and columns by themselves. And swapping two rows will leave all of the column relationships unchanged, as I've shown basically here. Um. Like in what case would it not be possible to do this? What's the strategy? Say we want this at the beginning. Then everything else already has to be sorted, otherwise we're kind of be like screwed. Actually, we can just say like pick some element. And then no matter like what we do, something's in its position like one of these elements. And because this element is connected to this, we can kind of go through the graph and propagate and make it so we want, <coughs> and make it so we can put this in its final position. And then we can cross this element off, ignore it, and solve for the rest, trying to put the rest in their final positions. And I think that just because this graph is connected, that means we can make any ordering. So that I think that works. Um, let's find out. Where's my DSU? Only doing doing DSU because I'm lazy. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, let's see in the end. Okay. Um. So we need some factorials. <coughs> um, This code is going to make it so we can do rows and columns at the same time, which is going to be nice. What am I trying to do here? Okay, so I want this to be here.
This is Vectora stuff. It's trivial. Um, and comment that because we're using the right mod. Yeah. So let's see. For loj equals zero, j is less than i, j plus plus. I'm gonna duplicate this. This is a trick. Basically transposes the matrix so we can use the same code to deal with both rows and columns at the same time. Okay, now. Just assuming we're dealing with rows here. So therefore, if mat i k plus mat j k is greater than, oh, um, let's call this x. It's greater than x, pause equals zero, break. If pause, d dot edge i j. Then for Oh wait, um, which needs to be like 5,005. 50 squared, about, it's like more a thousand, but I don't really care. Um, LOV equals D dot sizes, D, specifically I, the component, B times V minus one over two. This will be at least zero, so that works. What? Uh, <laughs> Why are there multiple DSCs? How does that mean? Yeah. Wait. How are there multiple DSCs then? Struct DSU. At coder. Oh shoot. Okay, I'm gonna um, uncomment that then, and then remember to recomment it later, ideally. Aye. Yeah, it's merged. Whoops. Grab my own template. It's always awesome. Six. Cool Y. How is it six? Hmm. That's a bit confusing. Am I screwing this up somehow? No, oh, wait, this should be. Yeah, it doesn't even make sense to do it like that. So we want to swap rows and columns, I think. So we want to reflect it along, along that diagonal. That does not help. What? I'm confused. Um, ideally, let's not have some issues with precedence. But what's going on here? N minus I minus 1. Let's see why that doesn't do it. Confused. Actually, this will have problems. But what should it be? It should be like something, right? Why is this not being found? That's a problem. J equals zero, J is less than I, J plus plus. Possible equals one. If mat I K, so the I throw at position K plus mat J K is greater than X. 
And we got some problems. This should be M minus M minus 1. Does that do anything? It does, right? Like any row. Yeah, it turns rows into columns. Why am I confusing myself by doing this? I don't really know. Don't do this, guys. This is stupid. Ah, uh, I miss a paren. What did I do? I did miss a paren. Now I'm quite confused about what's happening here. I want two factorial. Oh wait, it's just like straight up V. What am I thinking? I'll make the answer four. Why is this not merging? So this should be like one zero. So these two can go, these two can go, and these two can't. But it still means that like one oh oh. I'm so confused. What is happening here? What is happening here? Okay, that's simple. What is happening here, though? Swap this. My only idea is swap along this diagonal. Which would mean that it's like maybe the J should be the same, but the I shouldn't. I don't know why I'm doing this transposal, this makes no sense. I want to reflect across this diagonal, which means that it's like J the row becomes the column, except it's inversed. It's like M minus I minus one. And then the column becomes the row. So the row becomes the column. Like one of them isn't inversed. Maybe one of both of them are inversed. I think both of them are inversed and it's just swapped. <laughs> this is stupid. Don't do this. Just a word of advice. Don't confuse yourself with your own stupid optimizations that don't do anything. Oh, come on. What the hell? All right, what am I doing to this, honestly? Should have done this earlier.
I've already gone down this route, so I might as well just commit to it. So 327, it's not changing anything? Why did it not change anything? Oh boy. Should be M minus I actually. I don't think that makes a difference. Three, four, eight, one, seven, nine, five, seven, seven. Okay, um, matrix, do the thing, do the other thing, factorials, do the DSU, do this. If the thing is greater than the other thing, do the thing, d.merge, transpose it to be stupid and confuse yourself. Zoven cubed, and is 50, everything works out. Okay, technically O of n cubed log n, but screw that. Actually, no, it's not. It's n squared times m plus log n or something. I don't even know. That works, right? Factorial. Factorial is huge, even though we don't need them to be. Okay, perfect. That's fine. <coughs> Number of multisets is the same, same name as one of the other ARC problems, wasn't it? Multisets exactly n elements, and the sum is k. And they're all 1 over powers of 2. How's the standings? I think we held ourselves back on C, but that's stupid. Yeah, okay, we've been slow. Um, number of multisets. How many multisets of rational numbers satisfy all the following conditions? Multisets is exactly n elements, and the sum of them is equal to k. Each element is 1 over a power of 2. Interesting. There's no reason to use any element that's less than like multi sets of rational numbers. So if we have some number like let k equals equals 3. Then if we have, actually let n equals 3, I guess. And then k can be whatever. Say we have some number like 1 eighth. Then to make it into a whole number, because k is a whole number, or an integer, then we have to add 1 eighth to it. Or we can do something, yeah, eventually we have to add 1 eighth to it. So then we get 1 fourth. And we eventually have to add one fourth to it, and then we get one half. But then we've used three numbers, and we don't even have a whole number out of this. So there's no reason to use any number. Um, don't use any number less than or equal to. 1 over 2 to the n, <coughs> which means that 1 over 2 to the m minus 1 is the smallest number we can actually use. Okay, now let's say we put down elements in increasing order, because why not? Oh, so that gives us exactly n numbers we can use, n possible numbers, which is specifically um, up to 1. Then, 
Well, if we shifted all numbers by n and did knapsack, it would be slightly large, so we can't really do that. But let's instead decree that we're going to put the values down in increasing order. And therefore, once we put down a value, we can't put down any value less than it. That makes it convenient because now we don't have to keep track of the fractions that are less than this number. We assume that those fractions are resolved because we just do what they have to be. Um, interesting. Does that help? I don't know if it does. Could store the fraction, I guess. Um, that'd be stupid, though. We could do dp on the fraction itself where you have some number x over some power of 2, but that sounds insane, so let's not do that. Maybe this is useful. Let's say um, all we've put down is 1 over x. Our number is less than or equal to 1 over x. So if the denominator is less than x, and we've already put down the 1 over x, then by the condition of putting numbers down in increasing order, we just can't do that. So um, therefore, the number has to be, the denominator has to be x, or greater than x, but we'll assume it's x. Then we have some other number. Let's call it k over x. Now the next part is that k is less than or equal to n, because all the numbers we've put down so far have been less than or equal to 1 over x. So this k can't be too big. That's another step. And then um, what happens now? Will this help in any way? It's kind of a question. So now I have the number k over x. Let me put down i elements. So that's three numbers, which is too many. And the transition is actually even worse because we can put down any element greater than x, so that's not good. <clears throat> Instead we have to do something else. Actually, the transition isn't so bad. Because k has to be some power of 2, is I think how that works. k has to be divisible by the power of 2 for us to be able to use that number. Otherwise, we would kind of screw ourselves. Which is interesting. But it's still too many states. Yeah, it's still too many states. What, what can we cut out? To cut out something. Hmm. 
What's with these numbers? I don't know what this means, but they've used it many times. If we can cut out a single dimension, I think this will be enough because it'll be like amortized O of 1 or something. Or O of N. Is it amortized? Because it's kind of weird. No, it is amortized O of N. Okay. So if we can cut out a single dimension, we'll have O of N squared. How do we do that? And we know we're putting down some certain value of X. And How this work? So a transition would be put down one over x. So increase k by one, or um, push this number out to some higher x, or some lower x, like for example x over 2, x over 4, etc. This will happen n times for each state because we have n elements. Okay, that doesn't work. I think we somehow need a number of elements in there. We somehow need a number of elements. What else do we need? Um. We need everything currently so far, so we have to do something else. What's interesting about K? Is there anything interesting? Well, it kind of depends on how we got to X. We can't force anything else out of the construction because if we do, then... What if we go backwards and we put the bigger numbers down first? Does that help? We still have to keep track of the number. I feel like that doesn't help. But I don't know. Let's start with the sequence of K1s. We can break any number down into halves. Maybe that's useful. So we start off with K1s. 
and we can break any number into k, and we can break any number into two halves, which keeps the sum but creates another number. Like, for example, say k is 3, n is 5, um, something like this. k equals 3, n equals 5. Then we have 1, 1, and 1. And we need 5 numbers. But we can split this number into 2 halves, which will maintain the sum, but also create an extra element. Huh. Maybe that's how we do it. Because then it's just the number of ways to split. Which is to say we need a strictly decreasing sequence, for example, like two, <laughs> yeah, two zero, saying that we split a one twice, and then we split a one half this many times, and then we split like a one fourth this many times, and so on. Does that just work? I think that just does. Does it? That that also feels n cubed though. That's the problem. That um Does it need to be strictly decreasing? Well we need to make sure that we have enough one halves that we can do the splitting. No, it doesn't have to be strictly decreasing, I guess. It just has to be um like Every AI is less than or equal to two times AI plus one. Is that true? No, that feels wrong. No, it should be AI plus one is less than or equal to two times AI. How does that help? So now we can do a DP on this sequence. We need this sequence to sum to k, or n minus k, and we need, um, that code is crazy, man. We need that sequence to sum to n minus k, and we need this condition to be satisfied. And we don't care about its length. We don't care about its length. Interesting. So it's kind of like doing dp on the sum and then the last value, I guess. Hmm. Oh, how does that work? And does that work? I don't see why it wouldn't, right? dp of sum and the previous value. So this doesn't go on infinitely because if the previous value is ever zero, then we know we're done. Um, I don't know, that just kind of like feels right, man. I don't know what to say. Seen to end decay. No, that exists. Um, DP of Move that outside so it doesn't crash the stack. This is going to do that enough. And now this works, right? Like the length doesn't matter. It's just the sum and the last value. Yeah, so dp0. So the initial last value is um, B, just some number big enough. I guess V works. Yeah, actually then, because if N minus K is zero, then that works. Sure, okay. Now, um, for l i equals zero, i is less than v, right? i plus plus. For l j equals zero, k 
because the length of the sequence can also be at most n minus k, so that's fine. Um, all right, well, does transition work? I don't know. That's also kind of a problem. Maybe the transition doesn't work. Yeah, there are too many transitions. Hmm. Maybe a different approach is required again. Because the transition would be putting any number of numbers down. There's some way to hide, there's some way to compress the information here. The sum we have to keep track of, absolutely. But Anything we don't have to keep track of. That would be the question. Like the last value is whatever, right? Hmm. Number of sequences. All we care about is that we have enough to split. Possibly it's a prefix sum of some sort. What are the actual transitions? Let's just work this out because we can probably optimize this with a prefix sum. Um, so dp of i, let's call this s. And v, and actually, I'm going to define this differently now to be defined as the number of elements we had previously instead of like the number of elements we split. And that makes it so we can start off with k1s, and this is well defined, which is more convenient. So dp of sv is equal to the sum of 
of like a lot of things. Like we can come here from any value where um, it's like some of DP where it's like S minus K, which means we took K elements, which means we need any like V, which is greater than or equal to K. Some very weird column prefix thing we're looking at. But maybe that seems doable. I think it should be doable, it's just kind of messy. Um, What is V? I forgot what V. <laughs> right, we can only have V elements in the sequence. So um, somehow we do this. It's kind of like relative to every S simultaneously. I feel like the problem is there are just too many things to do. Would that be an issue? We're iterating through sums. Which means that for a fixed sum x, so we have x comma v. Or just say we have x. Then to x plus 1, it's going to contribute um, like 1, 2, uh, max something, and then to x plus two, it's going to contribute all values two to max. But this is a singular sum, so this whole transition is only O of n, I guess. Sure. Um. But what also matters is like the number of elements we took, isn't it? Maybe there's an easier way to do this with some sort of push DP. So x comma v can go to x plus 1 for all v greater than or equal to 1. You can go to x plus 2 for all v greater than or equal to 2. Maybe that's the way to do this. And then we don't actually need prefix sums. It's more like 
just like whatever is going on. J equals zero. Doing the mod right, right. How many times have we done mod now? Do we do it for A2? Yeah, we did, nice. <coughs> tote equals tote. Okay, now um, we're going to push out. J equals 1. J is less than equal to V. J plus plus. Um, what would it be? So, hello, new sum equals I plus J. And we're interested in any V. Yeah, so then um, tote equals tote minus. That will work. Okay. Now, um, new sum equals i plus j, dp, if new sum is less than or equal to v, dp and s, what would this be? This would be um, the number we take, which is j, 2 times j. Let's do that. Does that work? I guess it does. DP V zero. We treat anything that's like greater than or equal to v as the same just because like it doesn't matter. The sum must be at most v, so we'll assume we only care about at most v elements. And change my program in the middle of writing it. No way this works first try, but we'll give it a shot. Okay. So um, let's just do some printing. Zero, zero, zero. Oh, wait, what? DPBI. Does that actually work? Oh, it does. Six, eight, seven, two, three, two, two, seven, two. All right, so this is clearly O of n squared. And that's just it. Um, we add mod carefully to make sure that everything is within the range and not negative. Sounds right. This is fun. Just immediately this is how we get wrong answer. Great. What? Well, there's so many. Oh, that's a problem, isn't it? Um. Now I see if something like two five two five. Okay, so it's about exactly half. Yeah. Um, this should be less than or equal to k then. Why don't we just make this n? That'll make this easier. Min n two times j.
Why does that change stuff? Oh, this should be here. Four two. Okay, that was stupid. Totally ignoring half the states. Yeah, I probably should have tested it like that. That is a very peculiar bug because it only happens when k is greater than like v over two or or k is like greater than n over two or something. That is an interesting bug to make. But um, okay. Let's see if there's anything else stupid we did. So v equals n minus k. Mem set dp. Dp zero k. Sum. Do up to n now. Same thing. Doesn't really change anything. It's still three thousand five. We just make sure everything's within the range. And a split, and a split plus tote. And then we just do the exact same transitions. Nothing changes except everything is n instead of v because I'm an idiot. Yep, perfect. Let's try again. Okay, then we can read this problem. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, that works then. Ideally, we're doing less bad now. Probably still bad because of penalty, but ideally less bad. Okay, it's less bad, I guess. So we have to solve E to save ourselves. Nice. Consider an n times n matrix, denote by aij, the entry in the i row and jth column. For aij, where i equals 1 or j equals 1 holds. Okay, I don't trust this. Yeah, this is... Um, its value is 1 of 0, 1 and 2, and given in the input. So the max is just like a table, sure. That's like the only sample. Hmm. They define mix mathematically instead of just. So it'll never stabilize. That's the that's the thing. Is there a point where we get rid of the twos? No, there can't be, because there can always be a mix between zeros and ones. I guess. So what about like this row? What happens to this row? So first we take on this value and we get a 1. We take on this value and we get a 2, then we take on this value and we get a 0. How do we use that? I think the idea is we're going to take this column value, kind of mess with it a bit. I'm going to take this column value and mess with it based on the values in this row. We're going to take this column value and mess with it based on the values in this row.
Max is weird though. Max is very certainly weird. Birds. Is there a pattern we can use here? It's kind of a question. Get rid of these scribbles. Let's take some matrix like zero, zero, and then like what happens with stuff like this? We have like a streak of ones. So this will become two, this will become zero, two, okay. If we stick like a single two in here, how much does it affect things? Two, zero, one, zero, two, zero. If we made that a zero instead, then this would be one. Interesting. Doesn't say much, does it? even like do for this. What's F? Is it even worth thinking about? Given a graph. Fix zero more vertices and deletes them. That's fun. Looks like flows. Let's not do flows. Probably not flows, but it's got those small constraints, so who knows? Some sort of cut. It's a big sample.
हाँ जी इसके बनने के बाद Pretty sure F isn't happening, so let's just I shoot. Pretty sure F isn't happening, so we can just kind of disregard that. Um, I'm gonna try and finish off this problem. So the number of zeros is where there isn't where neither of them are a zero. The number of ones is where it's like a weird series of constraints. The number of ones is where there is a zero and something not a one. We can like redefine mex in some way to make it smarter. Zero is no zero. One is one of zero, and then something else not zero, or something else not one. And then two is specifically either zero, one, or one, zero. Which is even weirder. The entries in the matrix are zero, one, and two, respectively. Interesting thing is that like only this value is what matters.
It's interesting how this forms a pattern, and if we had if we had more zeros, it would kind of continue, but it just doesn't feel right. Look, let's say we have two, one, two, and then we have zeros here. Does this stay the same? So this would be one, zero, one. This would be two, one, zero. And this would be one, zero, one. Huh. Is this always the case? Maybe max is like invertible somehow. Or not, that's, I don't even know what that means, but I don't mean invertible. I mean like, there's some sort of pattern here that we get once we do some zeros. Ideally, there would be a pattern. It wouldn't be some like bash computation. So we have something else like one 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 maybe. Does ones do ones also produce a pattern? Is there something interesting in here? So we have zero, two, zero. We have two, zero, one. Then we have zero, one, zero. Let's continue that. We have two, zero, one. Okay, what about twos? Let's try that. So zero, zero, nice. Um, one, two, one. And then we get the same outcome. Okay. So that's interesting. Does it always form patterns like that? Would be the question. The more interesting question is what did other numbers do to the patterns? So why does Max even make patterns? Is a question. Let's take a single number and then just apply it. Like say we pick a two and we're just gonna apply two a bunch of times. So we get zero, then we apply two, then we get one, then we apply two, then we get zero, and so on. If we apply a 1 to 2 a bunch of times, then we get, I mean, obviously we'll form a pattern eventually. 1 to that, we get 2, and then we continue. If we apply 0, then we get 1, 0, 2, and it continues. The more interesting part is what happens if we apply in, like, alternating fashion or something. Actually, wait. One will pattern between zero and two. Yeah, that makes sense. Of course it would. If we're patterned between the number that like isn't the one being constantly applied, obviously. That does make sense, actually. Um, then what? What if we do something weird like this, where we apply this kind of alternating thing? 
So we do 2, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Hmm. Let's just generalize somehow. I don't know if it does. Just trying to like look at this, see what's happening. This is one zero one zero. Two makes it zero, one, zero, So what else does Max tell us? For example, um, if we know we have this input value. If we know we have this input array, we know we, there are only two possibilities for each of these, zero or one. This can be a zero or two, and this can be zero or one. Depending on that, we have other possibilities for everything else. But no matter what, the initial number is also always a possibility, which is interesting. It depends on the input that we get. People solving this? How many people are solving this? More people are solving this. Okay. Nice. What's up today? It's like slow. Okay, and there are certain numbers that make both of these happen, I suppose.
for example, to make this a zero, this will be like, it's just like what happens to all of these. And just listing this out. So zero two will make this a one, and a one will make this a two. A zero will make this a two, and a one two will make this a zero. One will make this zero will make this a one, and one two will make this a zero. Interesting. So when you have a two, it's kind of like it only depends on the other number. So having a two is like the equivalent of like bitwise not or something, which is weird. Having a zero is if you have another if you have a one then it's two. You have a zero, two, and then it's one. I, mean, I kind of just like ran out of brain power 15 minutes ago and I've just been trudging along for the for the effort I guess but I don't, know, I don't have anything on this maybe I'm close probably not I mean there's not much happening but let's just see what happens more people solve this people are solving this but like some people. It's the friend standings.
That doesn't even show me on it. Nice. Um, okay. So it came down to speed pretty much, because E is like a hard thing. In terms of my part, it was like speed. People solve these quickly. Wow. I did not solve these quickly. How much speed was it? So I've been like 63 minutes. Okay, it's not that big of a difference, I guess. Alright, well, what can you do? I can't do anything else. Because I know I'm already too tired to do this. So, I'll just do everything. I'll do the solutions. See what happens after the contest. Okay, this is simple math. Given your three positive integers A, B, and C, compute the following value modulo 9982443353, which is like a prime or something on that. But here is the idea that you want the sum from i equals 1 to a of the sum from i equals 1 to, er, no, it's like, I should actually follow the notation. A equals 1, and then B equals some sum from B equals 1 to B, and then the sum from C equals 1 to C of A, B, C. So let's just like put brackets around this, right? Now, in this group of brackets, this A is going to be the same no matter what. So every single element in these two sums is going to be multiplied by A. So why don't we just take it out? So now we have the sum from A equals 1 to A of A times this, where we take out the a. So this is the sum from b equals 1 to b. Again, this we can do this because every element is being multiplied by a anyway. So let's just like not worry ourselves about multiplying by it every time. We can just do it once at the end. But we can do the exact same thing here. This is the sum from a equals 1 to a of we can take out the b now of the sum from b equals 1 to big B of b times the sum from c equals 1 of c to big C of c. Oh, I forgot the a here. Okay, now this is more interesting. And why is it interesting? Because, like, this is just like, how do you, how do you word this in a way that, like, works? Like, this is constant. Because, like, this C is fixed. Specifically, this is a constant, and its value is, this is the triangular numbers, so its value is c times c plus 1 divided by 2. This is triangular numbers. You can look up that formula if you haven't heard of it before, but it's a very useful formula. So this is c times c plus 1 over 2. That's what this value is. So now we're interested in the sum from b equals 1 to big B of b times constant. So b equals 1 to capital B of B times X, where X is some constant. Now, because this is constant, we can take this out. We can take the X out, and we can say that this is the sum from B equals 1 to B times X. So, because, so X is this, and now we're interested in the sum from B equals 1 to B to B of this which is, by the same argument, b times b plus 1 over 2. And now this whole thing is a constant. So this a is being multiplied by a constant, which means we can apply the same argument. And so this is a times a plus 1 over 2. 
And the final answer is just all of these multiplied together because it's, it's just constants. These, this is a constant, which means this is a constant times b. So this whole thing can be represented as a constant times the sum of b, and you can do the same thing for a. So, in, so the answer is actually the sum from a equals 1 to a of a times the sum from b equals 1 to b of b, notation is great, times the same thing for c. These sums, despite like being a product or whatever, these sums are actually totally independent of each other, which is interesting. And in general, if you had more than three variables, you can do the exact same thing. So now the only bit being careful here is to avoid overflow. And at the same time, don't divide by two after taking mod, because that's a bad idea. Like you want, like the modular, the modular remainder may not necessarily be divisible by two. You can use the modular inverse of two, but it's easier than that. You can just take this number as a whole and then mod that. And you can do the same thing here, take this number as a whole and mod that. And then this, and you can multiply these three numbers together. It's just kind of being careful about mod. But the final answer is just this, and these are triangular numbers, so everything works. Okay. Now this is... Um, did I... Wait, what was... Did I go over the... Okay. So find the number of quadruples a, b, c, and d, such that a plus b minus c minus d is equal to some value k. Okay, so like quadruples are bad because we have a lot of things. But like, let's say we fix some number. Let's say we iterate through the possibilities for a. Then we want to find, um, since a is constant, we can kind of like just ignore it. So we have b, or we can't ignore it, but we can sort of ignore it in the sense of trying variables. So now we have b minus c minus d is equal to k minus a. But like this isn't much help. This isn't much more helpful because we need to find the sum of things, or we need to like we still have three variables, and we're already taking o of n time fixing the sum of a. But what if we did more? Let's say we instead um, fix the sum of a plus b. Actually, say we just tried another variable. So first we fixed a, and that didn't help. Let's say we fix both a and b at the same time. This is o of n squared, but we'll get into how to optimize this later. Minus c minus d equals k. But a and b are fixed, so we have negative c plus d is equal to k minus a plus b, where a plus b is a constant because both a and b are fixed. And then we have that, um, so c plus d is equal to, let me solve for things here, let me be careful, just negate everything. Then we have a plus b, which is again constant, minus k. So now we have to figure out the values of c and d. And well, all these values are within the range from 1 to n. So let's just ignore the fact that they're less than or equal to n for now and just focus on this, that they're greater than or equal to 1. Then what possible values for c and d will sum to some value? Let's say we're trying to make x. Then we could have 1 comma x minus 1. Could have 2 comma x minus 2, could have 3 comma x minus 3, etc., up until x minus 1 comma 1. Those are the possible values. Now, what's interesting about that is that some of these aren't possible because the numbers must also be less than or equal to n. So if some of these numbers are bigger than n, then we just can't use them. But in total, like, think, look at this left side. It goes from 1 to x minus 1. So there are only x minus 1 possibilities for these pairs. 
with some of them possibly being subtracted out because the numbers are too big. But this we can find in O of 1. We can find x minus 1, like x minus 1 obviously is just a number, and then we can find the number that we have to subtract out in also O of 1, because this is just... We subtract everything, um, like consider the bigger number. And in fact, consider only this side, because if these two sides, like think about this interval of badness, and we want to remove everything from this interval. But we're going to have an equivalent interval on this side. And if these intervals overlap, then we'll have zero anyway, so we can just assume they don't overlap. And then, like, worry about it later. So, every, we'll assume this, this value is the greater one. So every value where x minus k is greater than n is impossible. Let's find the point where it, let's find the largest, k, or the smallest k. Let's find the largest value of x minus k that still works, which is just setting x minus k equal to n. And then we can say that k is equal to x minus n. That works, right? Yeah, so then... If x is, like, very big, then we, have, we do have some things we have to subtract. But say x is, like, 3, and these pairs only go to 3, and n is, like, 17 or something, then we're not going to have a problem. So if this value is negative, we're just, like, done. We just kind of ignore it, because all the pairs are going to be valid. But if they aren't, then we have to subtract, in total, it's 2 times k minus 1, I believe. Um, I think, for example, say k equals 4... How this works? Say n equals 5. And we're interested in the sum of 7. Then this has 6, so this isn't going to work. But everything else is fine. So x minus n is 2. Wait, what? Something is slightly wrong here. Oh, no, that's right. It's 2 times 1. Yeah. So the number of things we subtract is 2 times x minus n minus 1, provided that this is greater than or equal to 0. Because if it's negative, we, don't, we can't, like, add pairs. So this is the number of pairs we subtract. And then if this quantity is less than 0, then that means we just have no pairs, because all of them are invalid. So in total, it's like the maximum of 0 and like the value. You can do some maximum stuff and make this easier to implement, but in general, just like be careful with negative numbers. All right, okay, but the whole point is we, know, we now know the number of ways to select a C and D such that um, the conditions are satisfied of the problem, and c plus d is equal to some x. Also, if x is like less than less than or equal to zero or less than two, it's like ignore it. Yeah. Okay. And this is like the value of x. Like we just know this because we fix the value of a and b. So let's call this like f of s, is the number of ways to make the sum s. Then, now we're just interested in f of this, a plus b minus k. Because that's just it, we need two numbers to sum to this. Okay, now the problem we had initially is that we fixed the values of a and b, and so this is o of n squared which is bad, but why are we fixing the values of a and b? Because all we care about is the sum of a and b, and we just figured out how many, how to figure out how many numbers sum to a given sum. So instead of fixing a and b, let's fix a plus b. And then we can use the exact same formula 
to figure this out. So in general, it's the sum of f of a plus b times f of a plus b minus k. Because the first part is the number of ways to get this sum, and then the other part is the number of ways to get this sum. And so if we call this value a collective x, which we can because we don't really care about the values of a and b themselves, only the number of ways to get them, then this is the sum of f of x times f of x minus k. Provided that, yeah, provided that both of these values are greater than zero. So yeah, that just works. And if you were to like verify that this is correct, you can do like x, like the total sum of this is x minus x minus k, which is just k, so it works. <coughs> but yeah, this final thing, le final answer, okay. So that's cool. C is like, I don't know, it took me longer than it should have. All of these problems took me longer than they should have, but uh, whatever. It's not really about rating. That coder is just whatever. So essentially we have a matrix. We have a matrix and a value k. Let's just yoink the sample. So we have um, 3, 3, 2, 7, 4, 8, 9, 1, 6, 5. We can do one of the two things. One of two things. We can swap. A, we can swap two rows only if, like, consider each column. The sum of the two values of the two rows in each column must be less than or equal to k, all of these. So this, the sum of these two must be less than or equal to k, and the sum of these two must be less than or equal to k. In this case, it's true, so we can swap these, but for example, taking these two rows, the sum of these two is greater than k, so it's not possible. And in a similar manner, we can swap two columns if the corresponding sums of elements in each row sum to less than or equal to k. We want to figure out how many different matrices we can obtain. And we're guaranteed that all of these elements are unique, which means that any sequence of swaps, we can just do whatever we want. My first observation is like, Rows and row and column swaps are kind of independent of each other. Because the column swap, like say we do all the row swaps first, and then we just kind of ignore the columns and we do them all at the end. But like row swaps don't change columns. So whatever elements were here, they're still going to be like here. I mean, it's still going to be like in the same relative order kind of. So we can treat row and column swaps independently. And now the question is how many different row how many like different groups of rows can we make and how many different groups of columns can we make? Okay. Now we get to the at coder part where we like make a graph out of everything. So let's <laughs> this is like a standard, I don't know, this is just the thing they like. So let's make a graph out of some stuff. Consider having a vertex for each row. And then add an edge between two rows if you can swap them. So this is row one, this would be row two, this would be row three. And in this case, you can swap these two, but you can't swap either of these two. So you can only swap row one and row three. And let's do the same thing for columns, where we build a graph for all columns and add an edge if we can swap two things. So we can swap column one and column two, and we can swap column one and column three, but not the other one. Okay. You can do this graph however you want, DFS, DF, DSU, however you like it. Um,
Yeah, you can do it however you want. But consider this. The main idea for this is that in any connected component, you can make it so you can do whatever you want with the rows. You can make, like in this connected component, you can arrange these three rows in any order that you want using some sequence of swaps. That's the claim. If that claim is true, then the number of ways to like permute this component is just the number of permutations, which is n factorial, and n is the size of the component. So then the final answer would be the product of the like sizes of the components. This is some weird notation, like the size of each component where ci is some component, I don't know. That factorial. Because there are n factorial permutations of any group of n numbers. Any dis any group of n distinct numbers. And this is the fancy product notation. And I've spent more time explaining this notation than actually like using it. So let's just kind of get rid of that. But the idea is it's the product of the factorials of all component sizes. We can do this for rows and columns independently and then combine them. So it's like without loss of generality, let's assume we're just solving for the columns. Now, how can we prove that we can always make it so um, we can make any order we want? OK, let me, let's consider some bigger um, graph. All right, we can like make some cycles, whatever you want. Now consider like this node. Let's take any node. Actually, let's take a node that isn't going to disconnect the graph. So, like the more edges we have, the better off we do. So, let's just assume we have a tree. And for any graph, we can find a spanning tree of it. So that's like fine that we can assume that we're working with a tree. Because if we don't have a tree, we can just take a spanning tree and work with that. Now let's consider some leaf on this tree, some, oh, some node that's only attached to one other one. Every tree will have at least one leaf, so that works. <coughs> now somehow, like, we have some final position for this leaf. We don't know where, but we know, or, like, some arbitrary final position. Right now, either it's already in this position, or some other node is already in this position. Let's say, for example, this one then we can swap these two nodes to make it so now this node is in this position. Now we can swap these two to make it so this node is in this position. And then we can swap these two to make it so this node is in the final position we want it to be. So now this node is in its final position, which means we can get away with just totally ignoring it for the rest of our lives because we, it's where we want it to be. And so now we have a smaller tree, and like sort of through like some induction or something, we can always do it. That's the, that's the proof for how we can always order it. And again, if we don't even have a tree, if we have more edges, we can find a spanning tree of this, and then we can take it. <laughs> and then we can like do it like that. Right, and this works for any position. It just needs to be some node. And we can always do this kind of like switcheroo kind of thing because the graph is already connected. We guarantee that too. So for every connected component, we can permute it however we want. And therefore the answer is the product of the factorials of the component sizes. I'm gonna write that out instead of doing, using math notation product of factorials of component sizes, where again, there's an edge between two nodes if you can swap them. Use a text box or something. Anyway, yeah, product of factorials of component sizes. And that is the final answer. So yeah, that one's fun. Um, we can go to D now, and we'll see what happened. Actually, I kind of want to see rating first, what happened to me. Like, it's not terrible. I shouldn't lose yellow, at least. 
Okay, it's like a very slight gain. 2200. Oh, wow. I did not expect that actually. It's a higher performance than I thought I would get. Interesting. I won't believe it that. Um, going for higher ratings later, but I'm actually happy with 2200. It's interesting how it is such a big gap, but it still is only like 300 performance or something. <coughs> anyway, we'll do better next time. So let's do D, because that's the other, other one I solved. Um, essentially, we want to figure out the number of ways to make Um, we want to figure out the number of ways to pick n elements to have some k, or to some decay, where every element has to be a f uh, like 1 over a power of 2. So for example, we can have 1 or 1 half or 1 fourth or 1 eighth, etc. And um, yeah, essentially that's what we do. How do we solve this? How do I draw dots? That's a good question too. How do we solve this? All right, this is an idea I came up with by just like trying a bunch of random things, having none of them work, and then just stumbling upon this idea. Let's say we start with k ones. Like for example, I'll say um, k equals five, and then n equals eight or something. Because we know that k is less than or equal to n. Let's say we start with k ones. Right? Then what we can do is instead of like trying to like count this stuff, we can say that we're gonna split this one into two elements, both of which are one half. Now what does this do to the array? Well, it creates another element. Now we have six, but the sum remains the same because we just split one element into two different ones. So that is the idea. What do we do with this idea? Well, now we're interested in the number of different ways we can split, which is to say, because we're working with multisets here, it's kind of the number of each final element we have in the end of the array or in the end of the process. So essentially, each like way of splitting things is different as long as we split like different numbers. So we're interested in a sequence. Consider, we can represent it like the number of sequences like this. First, how many times do we split a one into something else? Let's say we do it twice. And I'm gonna ignore these numbers for this. Then how many times do we split a one half into a one fourth. Let's say we do it three times. Then how many times do we split a one fourth into a one eighth? We can do that one time. Then how many times do we split a one eighth into one sixteenth? For example, we can do it zero times. And because we don't have any one sixteenths anymore, the rest of the sequence is done. <coughs> so it's a sequence of numbers representing how many times we split each number into smaller ones. And as soon as we have a zero, we're done, because like we have no more of the smaller numbers. So this sequence has two properties now. We want to count the number of sequences such that their sum is n minus k, because it's just like a requirement that we need to split exactly n minus k times, because we start off with k numbers, and we want to end up with n of them. But there's another condition. For example, say I do this, and then say I want to split a one-half three times, but like, just like, no, I can't, right? Because we only have two one-halves. And in general, if we split this, if we split at this level k times, then we have 2k, I'm uh, using different notation, if we split this level x times, then we have 2x of these numbers to work with in the next layer. So in this case, sanity check, in this case, um, like, this number can't be bigger than 2 times this one, which is to say, for all i, a i plus 1 is less than or equal to 2 times a i, where a is this sequence. 
this sequence specifically, not this one. This one. So these are the two conditions. The sum must be equal to m minus k, and ai plus 1 is less than or equal to 2 times ai. Okay, cool. How do we count these sequences? Well, there is a way. And the way is to do dp. So, like, this kind of thing suggests some sort of, like, knapsack, except they're all fractions, so it's not really that simple. And I ended up coming with an O of n cubed, but that's not enough, so this is a better way. And because the other problem is so suggestive of dynamic programming, it's kind of, like, sort of intuitive to also think of using dynamic programming here. And indeed, this works. Let, we care about two things when we're constructing a sequence. The sum and the previous value, because the previous value tells us what new value can put down. And the sum, obviously, we need the sum to be something specific, so we care about it. But it turns out we don't actually care about the length, because we assume all of these previous sequences are already unique. So if we do something unique in adding the new one, then it's still going to be unique. So it's really only about the sum and the previous value. How many different sequences can we get with sum of x and previous value of y? So let's um, formalize that. Number of ways to get sum x. And actually, you can define it as previous value. What I instead prefer to do is define it as the number of this, the amount of this we have, which is actually 2 times the previous value. So for example, we have 6 of 1 fourth, and y amount of value. Like for example, we can use 6 1 fourths. This is easier in terms of transitions. Now what happens here? Let's iterate through sum first, like fix some sum, and then we'll iterate through y. <coughs> now what happens? So we want to go from sum x to sum x plus 1. Then we can only do that if y is greater than or equal to 1, because we need to split exactly y of the current value into the next one. And we can't do that if we don't have that many. And so if we want to go to sum x plus 2, then y is greater than or equal to 2. If we want to go to sum x plus 3, then y is greater than or equal to 3. In general, if we want sum x plus k, then y is greater than or equal to... I did not mean to write 4 there. Um, if, if we want x plus k, then y must be greater than or equal to k. I notice that this is only the sum, but this state is automatically determined because we, like... We just like by default split one, split one of whatever number we have to make x plus one. So this we do one split, which means we have two numbers. Here we do two splits, which means we have four numbers. Here we do three splits, and here we have two k splits. Okay, now this is like a cool thing because think about this: for any sum x in which there are o of n of them. There are also O of n possible new sums to go to, each of which has a fixed value of the number of splits, which means that there are only O of n possible new values. Now the only problem is summing up the dp values where y is greater than or equal to 1, but this can be done with some sort of like suffix sum, for example, on the values of y. If we list out the values like dp of x1, dp of x2, etc., then all the values where y is greater than or equal to 2, for example, is just this suffix. For 3, it's this suffix. For k, it's like some other suffix. So we can maintain suffix sums over this dp, and therefore the total cost of computing is O of n squared, provided that we do this suffix, these suffix sums efficiently. And obviously the transition is just adding because it's like we get we get this number. 
we get this number of ways to do this and like add this on to that. So that's the idea. Transitions are just suffix sums. And um, that's basically it. Then the answer, then the answer is just the sum of um, dp of n minus k and the sum over all possible x of dp n minus k and x. Because it's like we can have any previous value, but the sum has to be fixed. And that's it, basically. So this is cool. It's an interesting kind of way to twist the problem, I guess. I wonder if there are other approaches to doing this, because this seems kind of outlandish, but it's also that kind of act coder thing where you just totally destroy a problem and turn it into something else. So I don't even know. It could be interesting. Um, if you guys had different approaches, maybe, I don't know, say them. Comments, whatever, I don't know. Okay, anyway. Um, new plan, I'm going to be streaming some Code Forces rounds soon, because I don't want to do them officially. Because I'm not ready to lose IGM yet. Well, actually, just like don't want to um, have the stress right now. So I'm just going to stream them instead of doing officially. And that'll be that. I think that's it. Did solutions for A to D. All right. Goodbye.